So my starting point is what caused it. And I'm going to start, I'm going to, all I'm going to do here is show you some graphs. There's just, there's no, there's no PowerPoint with words, it's just graphs. But there are graphs, You've got to look at the graphs. I start with a graph that comes from The Economist magazine. I think it's a good way to begin because if you can read The Economist magazine, you can read my book. It's not that hard. But this is a very interesting graph and there's another reason why I took it out of The Economist magazine from October 2007 which you'll see in a minute. There's a blue line which shows you the interest rate set by the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve uh, is, has generally sets interest rates as its operating procedure and it focuses on the federal funds rate. And the blue line, which is labeled actual in the picture, is the federal funds rate. So you can see it was at 6.5% in 2000, cut sharply during the recession in 2001, and then drifted down to 1% in 2003 was held at 1% through most of 2004, and then was raised very gradually, reaching five and a quarter percent uh, in 2006. The other line is uh, called the Taylor Rule. The Economist labels it the Taylor Rule, which is my other reason for using The Economist. That way I can be more objective. Uh, and uh, of course, the truth is they took this chart from me, but whatever. So, uh, so this is the Taylor Rule. And, and the basic concept here is this describes how policy worked in much of the 80s and 90s. And so it, wasn't, it was originally designed as a recommendation for policy, but it came to be a pretty good description of Federal Reserve policy and, for that matter, other central banks during uh, a period which performed very well, the 80s and 90s into this century. Sometimes economists call this the great moderation because we had long expansions. The 80s was a long expansion, the 90s was a long expansion. We had two very short recessions in between. So it was a good period and, and this, to the extent monetary policy was responsible for that and I think it was responsible for a large part of it, you can describe it, their actions in this way. All it really says is that when the economy starts to, to heat up or inflation starts to rise, then you raise the interest rates by a certain amount. When the economy starts to go into a recession, you cut interest rates by a certain amount. And that by a certain amount is really important because it tells the Fed uh, how much to raise the interest rates by enough to really contain the inflation if inflation's picking up or to mitigate the recession if there's a recession. So, so, that, so that describes policy. Now, as you can see, actual policy was quite a lot different from what it was, if you like, during the good periods, during the 80s in much of the 90s into this century. In particular, it was interest rates were way too low. Really, by mid-2004, you know, well into this expansion, the recession ended in 2001. The previous recession ended in 2001, so still way into 2004, the interest rate is at 1%. And that's low by other measures. You can, don't have to use this measure, there's others. And in fact, roughly three percentage points too low, as you can see at that point and then gradually it closed. So this is my measure of, of monetary excess, if you like. And, and I think the history of booms and busts is that almost all of them are caused by excesses of some kind. And I think the housing boom, uh, which we'll, we'll focus on here, largely caused by this excessively loose monetary policy. And the economist, in their joke uh, play on words, calls it loose fitting. Uh, it's not fitting the Taylor rule, and it's very loose uh, policy. So that's the, if you like, the evidence for policy being way too easy, way too stimulative on the monetary side, monetary excesses. Um, there's other measures, but that's the main one. So now let me go to the second picture, which is trying to demonstrate as rigorously as I can that that monetary ease was a factor in the housing boom. Because it's easy to say monetary policy caused it or greed caused it, or savings from China caused it, you know, not enough regulation caused it, all these things. But it's another thing to actually try to demonstrate that that cause was a factor. So it's very important for me to try to link the event to what happened. And so this is, this is really how I do that. So the, the red line is housing starts, and that illustrates the boom we had in uh, especially 2003, 4, and 5. You can see it zooming up, uh, housing starts go over over 2 million, 
at an annual rate, and then, you, then they plummet, and if you extended that line, it would almost reach the floor at this point, because we're only, it's about a, a half a million starts at an annual rate right now. So it's a huge boom and a huge bust. What's the blue line? Well, the blue line is what happens if you take the interest rate recommended by the Taylor Rule and stick it into a model, which I built and estimated. So a counter, this is now the counterfactual, if you like. I want to ask, if you, I want to say, if I think that excessive ease in monetary policy was a factor in this crisis, the, the boom and the bust of housing, which led to the, uh, the mortgage market problems, et cetera, then I have to kind of demonstrate that. So the demonstration is I have a link between the interest rates by the Fed and the housing starts. It's a model. I won't describe the details, but what that model says, if you stick in, if you assume that the Fed had had the higher interest rate, then you would predict the blue line, and that's called counterfactual, and there was, would not have been the boom, and therefore not have been the bust. It would have been a smooth, rather smooth uh, behavior, not anything like we actually had. So this then is the way I try to prove, if you like, uh, this uh, explanation, demonstrate it. And um, there's other ways you can do it, but that's the main thing. So, so the thing is, the con there's a connection between the low interest rates and the housing boom and bust. Now, and, and the, um, let me just mention a couple things here. There are, of course, people who challenge this view. And probably the most famous challenger is the chairman of the Fed during this period, Alan Greenspan. And he's written, uh, written in the Wall Street Journal, challenging it. And so I just want to touch for a couple or three minutes on the nature of the challenge. He never says that we were concerned about other issues, holding rates low. He never says we were concerned about, say, deflation in Japan or something like that. But he does say that we couldn't have affected this by raising interest rates. And the argument, there's two parts of the argument. <clears throat> One is that uh, the low interest rates were caused by the uh, flow of savings from China and other countries into the US, which pushed interest rates down. So it's sometimes called the global savings glut explanation. And that held interest rates down. And so even if the Fed had raised the interest rates up to the, the uh, Taylor Rule area, uh, we still would have had the housing boom. We still would have had the crisis. And, and this chart tries to just say, well, prima facie, there's some problems with that argument. There was not a global savings glut. This is just a picture of the global savings rate going back to the 70s up until the period in question. And you can see there is no global savings glut. Savings are, as a fraction of GDP, the savings rate is relatively low, much lower than it was in the 70s, 80s, and much of the 90s. So um, the argument has to be made more sophisticated than that. And what Alan will sometimes say now, well, I know this, but what I meant was that desired savings was high compared to desired investment. And, and so then that raises questions, how do you measure desired? So I haven't seen that done yet. In fact, I haven't seen any, any other model other than this one that I showed you um, on this issue. A second thing that people raise is that, well, if, if there's monetary policy causing this housing movement bust and all the problems in the subprime market, then what about other countries? There were booms, housing booms in Spain. Etc. Well, what's quite amazing is since I did this, started on this work, uh, other people have gotten interested. And some people, some economists at the OECD in Paris have looked at this approach, looked at a whole bunch of other countries. They looked at all the OECD countries. And they found an amazing, I think it's an amazing, relationship between the degree to which central banks were off the Taylor rule, if you like, the accumulated uh, deviations from the Taylor Rule explains or is correlated with a large amount of the housing booms. And that's what this picture shows. So we already know Ireland had a big housing boom. Spain had a big housing boom. They're up in the upper right-hand side of that picture. Well, they also had the greatest degree of deviations from uh, the desired level of interest rates. So there's something there, and uh, it seems to me that's another reason why this may have happened more globally.